A good friend of mine, Joe Hudson, who's the Hispanic Liaison Officer for the Annapolis Police Department in Maryland, called not long ago and asked if I would be willing to use the English Learner Portal platform to help bring attention to the uh, issues around working with students with trauma. Uh, Joe and I worked together when I worked in the school system nearby and we worked with a group called the National Compadres Network to bring some healing uh, La Cultura Cura curriculum to the district to help students who were having a difficult time. As I spoke with Joe, we realized there are a lot of different pieces to working with students who have experienced trauma who are currently under a great deal of stress and experiencing trauma day to day uh, being immigrant students or even native born students in the United States who are still living pretty traumatic uh, lives day to day. So we decided to start a series where once a month we'll highlight some best practice or something to consider when it comes to working with students and their social emotional needs. For this first interview, I spoke with Luis Cardona who we met through the National Compadres Network and through his work with a local uh, nearby school system and county a few miles down the road with a significantly larger English learner population. Uh, Luis was of so much help to us in our district that I wanted to bring his perspective to you for our first installment of working with students in trauma and dealing with social emotional health for all students. Here's my conversation with Luis. Kind of like, uh, I would always think that typically what you would get instead is that they're saying no, that their expectations are too high. But what, what they're saying is that in certain ways, uh, feel like they're dumbed down, kind of the term they, they tend to use at times. Um, but then the other piece is like, uh, and, and this is both, um, not just as what I've seen as a practitioner, but even as a parent, I haven't had children formerly in public in, in public schools specifically, but in particular, uh, I noticed in a lot of my, my child's classroom observations, and not just observing him, but other children, back when core curriculum was in place in particular, it really, really undermined the uh, creativity and innovation and the thinking of, of many students who kind of processed their thoughts differently or kind of uh, process the education a little differently. And just to give you an example, I remember one time, it was during the library class and, and my child was in the first grade at the time. And there was a child who I kind of heard through the grapevine uh, of um, other parents that like, hey, this child had a lot of special needs. He was born here, he was an African-American child. Um, and um, I could see that he really struggled to you know, stay on task. Right, but then finally, when the teacher allowed him to do something differently than the rest of the students, he really got into it. But by that time, they had to move on to the next session because uh, of how rigid core curriculum was. <laughs> and I just kind of I went up to her in a very respectful way. I was like, "Hey, that you know, wasn't that amazing to see how he he started doing this work and he was just flowing?" And she's like, "Yeah, but it was also heartbreaking." because I knew he needed more time to do that, uh, just to continue in the learning process. And mm -hmm. I think for the most part, I think teachers get that, but sometimes uh, because they're, they're mandated or required to comply with state guidelines in education, that you know, they make a decision. Either I'm gonna do my job and do it the way the state wants me to, or I'm gonna you know, do, go outside the box a little bit and I'm gonna, you know, take some risk here, you know? And I can really relate it to that because I used to be a teacher at the foundation school in Prince George's County years ago before I took my job in Montgomery County. And during that time, um, I noticed that because of the students that we had, the level of trauma, and again, all U.S. born, primarily African-American youth and some Latino youth and a, and a couple of white kids. But the interesting thing was that uh, I noticed that the, uh, the teachers in particular lacked a lot of, lot of uh, skill sets in dealing with, with students who had, you know, higher levels of trauma. And, and, and the good thing that now in, in, in this professional work, dealing in trauma-informed uh, 
practice or whatever, and through the uh, the lifting up of uh, adverse childhood experiences as, as an indicator of trauma, um, it's kind of put us in a position where it forces us to be more intentional about dealing with that, right? Especially when you have students and children with high um, score ACE scores. And what I noticed when I was a teacher at Foundation is I was I was the teacher that all the other teachers would send their kids to because they're like, hey, he, he or she gets their work done in your class. And a lot of it, which is what I would explain to my peers at the time, it was like, it was all based on the climate that I created in the classroom. You know, from the intentionality of greeting all my students at the door, connecting with them when they walked into the class, when they left the class. Uh, from being intentional of the just the environment, having plants in there, you know, and just kind of how that has an impact on the environment and on the energy of the students and really being able to uh, uh, create a nurturing environment for them that also, that they themselves own in the classroom as well. And I noticed there was a huge difference um, in my classroom and the other classrooms where the teachers were like, no, this is how I'm going to design my classroom and you have very little say so in this and this is how it's going to be. Right, because you're looking at the classroom being a second home and mm -hmm. you know uh, us teachers take a lot of pride in designing our classroom and we're yeah. you know decorating it and making it making it our way and because and we live in there too um, yeah. but it, it it is a good point to go back and really think about you know what's what environment what represents your students will they feel the same comfort you feel in that room are they represented do they have a say so so they're good things to remember as you especially as we go into a new school year and you're setting it up setting up your room yeah. at the beginning and, and and i'll give you another example right so at the beginning of the year because my, my my son my, my uh my nine-year-old is in, in a parochial school and i kind of prepared his teacher his third grade teacher and just let him know hey look there are certain things that as a family we don't celebrate or lift up so i'm just letting you know because you know i have a child um who is kind of uh you know he's not rigid but he kind of stands by his beliefs and his values um he may question or he may say something not to be kind of uh not to be standoffish with you as a teacher or your authority, but kind of like, hey, this is kind of where like principals and teachers in the home sometimes clash with kind of mainstream uh, messages of, uh, of education. And um, it, it was around Columbus Day. <laughs> and to her credit, I was amazed. In the, in the Catholic school, uh, she was very intentional in her classroom, setting up the space to really embrace some of the historical perspectives that were connected to the controversy in a Catholic school, which I thought was powerful. Yeah, sometimes we just don't think about it until someone points it out. And then once someone mentions it, I think most teachers are willing to, you know, try to figure out how to work with everyone. Um, we just sometimes don't know. So having those conversations are really important. But again, going back to what I said earlier, that risk taking that, you know, how do I go outside the box? You know, kind of like what you just said, like, how do we respond to this thing that we weren't aware of before or a different perspective? And I think that's the main thing that I always uh, try to encourage all educators is to think about that. Even even if we, uh, through our own value systems, may not agree with, with the principles or the perspectives of others or our students, how do we do that? How do we embrace that, you know? And do it in, in a way that also in particular with children, that we're not shaming them, you know? Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, I always, you know, when I work with parents, I always tell the same thing. Like when we're trying to talk to our educators about that, we gotta be mindful about that because educators have feelings too, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna shame them because this is, they just didn't know, right? Right, yeah, they, I would say, you know, I've run across very few teachers in 25 years who really aren't trying to do the very best they can and care about kids. We just sometimes don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when it comes to being exposed to culture, uh, it varies you know, mm -hmm. for teachers depending on where they're from. Um, being teachers, you are automatically have tend to you know fall towards people who understood enough about the systems and schools to get through a degree program, mm -hmm. which kind of 
automatically puts a little separation and understanding for others who don't know how to do that or don't have that exposure yet or are still trying to figure it out. So it does take some uh, outreach and stretch to get everyone to try to see things from other people's points of view. Is there anything in particular that um, you see in schools that teachers should be aware of, of just, you know, with the basis being students with trauma, but not necessarily. We've talked a lot about just making sure everybody fits in. Uh, when it comes to students who have experienced trauma, how, how do teachers even know or what do they look for? And then if they, if they think that might be part of it, what do you recommend as first steps in that they should take? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, um, I always encourage teachers to really um, go to some level of training and understanding of what it is. Um, but there's a complexity to that too. And I learned that years ago um, where uh, teachers started going through a, train, a trauma-informed training, um, which was great. The only problem was they went to that training, so now they knew what was happening in the lives of the kids. And teachers like, oh my God, how is this child going to learn <laughs> with all this stuff going on in his right. own home? And in particular, I think going back to 2014, uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues um, that, that I knew who were educators here in Montgomery County uh, started confiding me and telling me, hey, Luis, you know what? Um, I'm aware about what you know a lot of these kids who recently arrived are going through, or even some of my other kids in terms of their born and raised here and what they're going through. But um, now I'm having a hard time processing this. So now they're admitting that they're suffering from secondary trauma. Um, it was that point that we started having the, these discussions around the importance of getting, you know, it's kind of what Jerry Theo from National Bodies Network always talks about getting beyond just being trauma-informed and how do we really understand what a healing-informed practice looks like and how do we help develop the, the, the coping skill set with young people, students in general, to deal with these traumatic experiences because often the trauma doesn't go away, unfortunately. And so we, as teachers or practitioners that are dealing with it, we get re-traumatized as well because every time they come and confide in us, now that they know that we understand and empathize with them, they come mm -hmm. and share more. You see, and that's the flip side. When you do capacity building, I tell people all the time, you know, he said, understand, as you develop these skill sets, um, you're going to develop them, and your students are going to read that, and they're going to read you, and they'll be like, okay, he or she knows what I'm going through. So they're going to, they're going to come to you, which is great, but now you have to make sure you have a support system for yourself. And you have to right. make sure a plan for what's going to happen as mm -hmm. he's uh, expressed to you because going back to 2014 that's what I noticed when we started having the surge of unaccompanied minors in this area I was trying to figure out and I had never seen um, so many different levels come to me in my program in particular my staff to address issues that had to do with students and mind you all my programs are primarily focused on gang involved youth okay for the most part but they kept coming to us. And then I, I started realizing what it was is they started realizing that we had the skill sets to deal with that population because we had a good solid foundation of not just being trauma informed, but also understanding what healing informed practice looks like and putting it into play. And so I, I think that's, that's the area that, that, that both educational systems, but educators need to understand as well as education policymakers is it, it's a continuum of, of, of care or a continuum of systems that have to be uh, implemented in that. Because just to make a system or have teachers solely go through trauma-informed uh, training um, is not necessarily going to help the situation out. And I'm not trying to discourage educators from doing it because you have to do it. We have right. to do it in age. It's inevitable. We have to do it. But we have to go beyond that and be very intentional in our efforts to make sure that we're, we're supporting, uh, providing support for our teachers for them to continue to grow in this arena. Not because we want them to be psychologists, therapists, or social workers, but because it's going to help them in dealing with their students. 
Yeah, I think um, when you were talking about trauma informed and being able to just be able to consider what might be happening with your students in the classroom that it's not always a behavior thing or a personal issue with the teacher or something we should take offense to or get frustrated with that's step one of really understanding what it looks like what it means um, and without the next step that you were explaining which is you know what do you do once you recognize this we don't want to fall into I guess the and the only word I know for it is like the pobrecito model. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you poor thing, I'm going to not have high expectations for you. Exactly. You've been through so much. Exactly. Uh, you know, we're going to excuse you from. But that's where our hearts go first. And so we really have to help teachers know that that's not going to help. Like, it's, it's good to have compassion. But then what do we do? Yeah. And, and that's the reality, because again, I, I just want to cite my experience at Foundation. Um, you know, so I had this one student who was bullied by all the other students in the, in the school. He was a ninth grader. And um, I never had any issues with none of my students around discipline and behavior. And I had, I mean, I had students who had committed serious crimes, carjackings, aggravated assault, attempted murders, I had students of mine who were, who were shooters involved in, in shootings, always very respectful with me, right? Now, I, I set some clear guidelines in terms of what my expectations were from day one, and I think they knew right away. And, and yeah, you could say maybe having the male presence played a role, but regardless, I was really clear about that. But that one ninth grader was very disrespectful. I'm like, what's driving this? Like, you know, what's going on with him? And um, one day, yeah, he just randomly comes into my classroom and um, he said, Mr. Cardona, I want to apologize to you. And he brings me a plant because I used to keep plants in my office. He brings me a plant. And the irony is he, the, the, what started our attention is he wanted to bring a plant, but he said he wanted to bring in a marijuana plant. And I was like, well, that's not going to happen. But, <laughs> you know, but he kept, I'll bring you a plant, but it's got to be marijuana. I said, that's not happening. So he brings a plant, and it wasn't marijuana. And he says to me, hey, Mr. Cardona, I, I want to apologize to you. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I want to apologize to you for, you know, how I've been carrying myself in, in the class. And I, wow, okay. So what's going on, you know? Um, he said, no, you know, I, I spoke to my dad last night. And his dad is doing life in prison. His dad just by chance happened to know who I was in my former life. And, and I, I knew who his father was. We didn't care for each other when we were much younger, but it was really mm -hmm. interesting because I said, well, what did your father say? He said, well, let's listen, listen to that man because he knows where he's come from. And then I said, okay, well, with that said, why, what was going on? Like, why did you feel the need to be disrespectful to me? He said, Mr. Cardona, the rest of these students eat me up every day. And you're the only one that I felt safe enough to be able to act out with and be able to push buns with. Because my hope was, as much as the rest of the students in the classroom respect you and admire you, that by me pushing you, they're going to think, oh, this, this fool is crazy. We got to leave him alone. Oh, so he's going to get respect through you. you yeah. Right. 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 And in a safe place because he knows you're not going to let anything happen to him. Yeah. From the others. Yeah. And, it's and interesting it, how, it, how minds work, how you process and try to come up with a plan. And they re the students really are trying to come up with a plan. They're just young and, and their plans don't always make sense, but they, they're trying to figure out a plan. Yeah. 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 I mean, we never forget those empathizing teachers and counselors to see light in us, that see potential in us. We don't forget that, but we also don't forget those that push us to be our best. And that's, that goes back to the whole expectation thing. Right. So you mentioned a couple times you talked about, um, about healing, um, mm -hmm. taking students to the next step, which is, you know, first we recognize what's going on and then we work them toward healing. Um, I know that's not something that every teacher 
would feasibly be trained in or, or have time to do with students. But um, can you tell us just a little bit about what's involved in that? And then for those who do have an interest in pursuing that, what are some good ways for them to learn more? Right. I mean, you know, I think you're familiar with some of the trainings we've done in the past, whether it was in your former job in Anne Arundel County, here in Montgomery and Prince George's County, um, in, in particular related to the uh, culturally based practice of Cultura Cura through the National Compadres Network, great um, pedagogy to really consider. Um, but then at the same time, there's also some practical things that you can do in the classroom, which is because some of the things that I did as an educator, I knew I was not going in my former teaching job, I was not going to be able to run a whole Noble group, for instance, right? Um, but I also understood that there's a lot of healing in gardening and in planning, right? And so, you know, with that, with that said and done, that, that was the intentionality of why I always had plants in there. And um, whether it was giving seeds to my students to, to help them to grow their own plants in, in our classroom. Um, you know, again, little practical things, right? But then there's, there's like the food stuff. I mean, like, um, you know, last night uh, I was doing a site visit with one of my staff at one of our school-based programs that operates in the evening. Again, you know, and, and, you know, citing Jerry Theo, he, he talks about this a, a lot, you know, the, the healing power of, of cooking and nutrition. And not just in terms of the preparation and the, the nutrition of it, but even in the smell of the food and the memories that it brings back, right? And so I kept noticing last night with the students uh, in particular, many of them kept talking about, yeah, man, I feel like I'm back home in El Salvador. I'm uh, like, I'm back home in Guatemala or whatever. The, the smell of this food reminds me of my grandmother who they miss so much, right? So often. And so there's, there's little things like that that we can do uh, as well. Now, obviously, you got to, you know, how that plays itself out in a math class where, you know, you don't have access to a kitchen or you can't do a cooking class or a gardening class. I mean, again, it, it's all a matter of, how, you know, how you connect it. And, and, but then giving them the ownership, because remember, when they leave our classroom, right? And again, this goes back to what I said about when I'm standing at the door and I'm greeting them. Um, I was, I'm always greeting them on that Monday because I knew where they were coming from and what they experienced that weekend. And then on Friday, I was doing the same thing because I knew they were leaving my safe space, right, or our safe space, and they were going back to that environment that is so toxic for them. And so if anything, I, I knew they would feel like, hey, you know, Mr. Cardona truly cares. He's trying to do his best, and there's a reason for it. It's not just because Mr. Cardona is a good man, but it's also because Mr. Cardona sees something in me. And that's how it was applied to all students, you know. And I will, I will honestly say, though, for those troublesome students, and even now, because um, I, I, I coach um, youth sports as well, with some of my most troublesome kids, I do that. I try not to do negative reinforcement, but I, I try to kind of, you know, uh, you know, redirect the negativity or whatever struggles they have behavior-wise um, to kind of lift up those things that are doing right. 